Thank you for being here with us and um, welcome to our show. Thank you for having me. So in the last days, there's a social media that, that has drawn all the attention all over the world. We are talking, of course, about Clubhouse. So first of all, tell us, have you tried it? Yes, I have tried it. I've been on it since January, so I'm also a new user. So let's add some context for the ones who don't know or never heard of Clubhouse. It's an audio-only social media. It's invite-only and accessible only from Apple mobile devices. This could sound very exclusive, but it made quite an impact in, the f- in a few days, especially because one of the biggest influencers on Earth, Elon Musk, decided to join and to promote it. But this is not the story we want to tell you. We want to see what happened in China. We know that Clubhouse has already been banned, but I want to start from the beginning. How did it get there and when the success erupted? Well, I want to also add another thing that's important about Clubhouse, which is that it's real-time audio. In other words, the conversations happen in real time and then they are not recorded and saved so that people can watch later. And that's going to be something really important in terms of factoring into why these conversations in the Chinese speaking world became big. Um, in terms of your other question about how it got um, big in Asia, is that, is that your question? Yeah, exactly. So let me back up a little bit and say that Clubhouse is a startup that was around since the middle of last year. And as a Silicon Valley based app, the early users were friends of the co-founders, frankly, who spoke a lot about tech and investment and Bitcoin, all these topics, none of it related to human rights, none of it related to the intense conversations that we have seen in the Chinese speaking world. What I started noticing was that Um, the app started expanding its invites. In other words, it was looking to expand its user base in January. And very quickly, you had users in Hong Kong go online. And that was very interesting for me. And most people in Hong Kong speak Cantonese. And I was in the Cantonese chat rooms listening in on, on conversations. And then a, a day later, we started seeing people from Taiwan joining Clubhouse app. And then suddenly we had an influx of mainland Chinese users. Some of these people from mainland China were outside of China, but others were from inside China. And once you had those three big groups, mainland Chinese, Hong Kongers, and Taiwanese, things got very interesting. They started engaging with, with each other and, and they engaged in rooms and spoke the what I call the lingua franca, which is Mandarin. And things got even more interesting when Uyghurs started using Clubhouse, especially the activists overseas who are constantly looking at ways of spreading their message, of advocating, of course. And um, the conversations just got incredibly intense, incredibly intimate. Um, We had this unusual situation of Uyghurs, Hong Kongers, Taiwanese, mainland Chinese, all in one digital space and room. And you don't get that even in real life, which is why I think it's significant because you had mentioned, uh, Marco, that of course it's exclusive, it's elite. How many Chinese were going online in the grand scheme of things? Just a few thousand, a few thousand out of 1.4 billion people. How important is Clubhouse in all of this? And I think that um, in terms of numbers and representation, it perhaps is not important. But in terms of the, the, the particular mix of the rooms and the content of the conversations and what was being shared, that's why this became a story. Before going to the Chinese ban on uh, Clubhouse, I would like to focus on the conversations that uh, were taking place. First of all, you said three main sensitive topics, Xinjiang situation, Hong Kong challenges, Taiwan controversy. Right. What's the difference between what happened on Clubhouse and what happens on the other platforms that have been uh, created and disappeared in the years? I think the difference is the particular aspect of audio. Uh, You run a podcast, so you know that there's an intimacy to the voice. So that when you hear conversations on radio, it feels much more personal and private. 
So that's number one. But on the other hand, radio is not video. So with video, you can see each other and there's a level of, um, of a publicity with that. You can hide behind your voice on an app where no one can see your facial expression. So it's this combination of privacy and intimacy on Clubhouse that I think allowed people who spoke Mandarin to come together in a room and talk about things that they normally wouldn't talk about. For example, Taiwan and China, a lot of Taiwanese travel to China. There's a lot of business done between Taiwan and China. So you would think that a lot of conversations would have already taken place about politics, about democracy, about independence. But the reality is, if you're a Taiwanese and you go to China and you do your business and you have your business meetings and maybe you have some friends, you'll meet up and have dinner and you'll talk about things. But how often do you really talk about the, in America, what we call the third rail topics, right? The really touchy topics. It's unlikely you would do so, unless maybe you after a few drinks or something. Um, so what I think happened on Clubhouse is that people went from zero to 60 miles an hour very fast um, and, and started talking about the conversations that you really don't have unless you really get to know somebody usually. And, and I think that's what um, made it particularly interesting. And um, the other thing is, of course, that in China, it's become more and more difficult to get a sense of what people behind the so-called Great Firewall think and say. Uh, their own social media ecosystem, which is separated from uh, the ecosystems in Europe and also in the United States, those ecosystems in China get censored constantly. Um, it's predominantly very nationalistic now. There used to be a time on China's version of Twitter called Weibo where people would be able to say some things and maybe their comments would eventually be censored, but it would be up there online for long enough for other people in China to see and to debate about it. And that space ever since uh, the leadership of Xi Jinping has gotten tighter and tighter as Gabriela uh, would know as someone who's been in and out of China since a decade ago. And it's very significant closing of space. So there's been more curiosity um, about what Chinese people think because we have had less access to it. Even with the great foreign reporters in China going out and interviewing people, it's this unfiltered moment where people got together in a room, had very intense conversations. And let me just give you an example of some of the intensity, right? You had Han Chinese, some of whom, many of them perhaps, uh, get access to international media reports, um, especially the mainland Chinese who work overseas. And they would. there was one woman who apologized to the Uyghurs listening in the room, saying that she felt so ashamed and that she was convinced that Han Chinese, that is the ethnic majority in China, that Han Chinese were standing on the wrong side of history. That's exactly what she said when it comes to the Xinjiang detention camps. And you had Uyghurs listening to this. Most of the Uyghurs were overseas, but what was stunning about Clubhouse was that for a few days, there were Uyghurs in Xinjiang who were on the app as well. Not a lot, we'll never know how many, but that was also very key because it has been so difficult to report from that region. And these people in Xinjiang, whether they were Han, Chinese, or Uyghur, to be frank, were able to confirm some of the things that we know from reporting. It's not as if we don't trust uh, the fantastic reporting of the, re of the journalists, but it is always interesting to get um, confirmation and alignment from people who are living in that region saying, yes, there are checkpoints. Yes, I have friends who went to re-education camps and came out. Yes, they were forced to learn Mandarin. Yes, they were given ideological training. Yes, they were told to love the Communist Party. Yes, they were told to love Xi Jinping and all of that. And to hear it from somebody who was there right that moment, I think has been very powerful for people to listen to. And not just for um, the Uyghurs who were overseas, but you know, um, outsiders who understand Mandarin, Hong Kongers, Taiwanese, all of that. So, Melissa, in all these discussions you're mentioning, can you tell us uh, like two or three examples of uh, topics that uh, really struck you? Well, 
one of the topics, of course, was on Xinjiang, right? And the detention camps there. And there were people in the room who had never heard about it. Um, there were people who had heard about these camps in China, but they were mm, skeptical about it. And those were intense conversations because if, imagine if I was listening and there was a Han Chinese sort of dismissing the detention camps as, as a plot of Western media. And the person even said, how could you guys do this? All of you in this room are just awful, awful people for perpetuating lies against our country. And you had Uyghurs who have family members who had disappeared listening to this denial. So can you imagine that intensity, right? So number one, you have Xinjiang. You also had very interesting engagement between those in mainland China engaging with people in Hong Kong and discussing the protests and what happened. And some people, there was genuine curiosity, I sensed from people in mainland China. Uh, they wanted to know, you know, you know, that they had heard this piece of news. Was it true? Or like, this is my understanding of what happened in Hong Kong. Is that true? And what really underscored for me um, in all these conversations is an asymmetric information um, in terms of those outside of the Great Firewall and those behind. Um, and then the third interesting topic was also on Taiwan. And here you had a lot of fascinating conversations about Taiwan, mainland Chinese asking about the different political parties, um, asking about the political environment, asking about how the democratic system works and where there were problems with the democratic system and Taiwanese explaining their point of view and um, their position. So those are the three topics, Xinjiang, the Hong Kong protests um, and Taiwan and what Taiwan is. Uh, there were, of course, other hot button issues. Eventually, there was a room on the Tiananmen Square incident in 1989. That was inevitable. But I think that um, most important are the most recent events impacting people today. And that is Xinjiang, the Hong Kong protests, and Taiwan as an independent democratic state. Given that you are so deeply involved in uh, the international context, uh, in the international politics uh, analysis, you know that one of the defining uh, tools of uh, propaganda and counter-propaganda in the last 10 years, let's say, is trolling. So um, what happened on those chats? It has been there some phenomenon of uh, trolling of uh, <laughs> external? Mm? Yeah. Yeah. So could you could you please detail it a little more? Yeah, I mean, there were definitely people. I don't know if it's there were definitely people who would start shouting in the room um, about Taiwan, like being pro independent Taiwan or very pro democratic Hong Kong. And then there were also people who were very pro nationalist China that would shout occasionally in the room and and it would upset everyone in the room. And and then everyone would have to figure out who who shouted this and eject them from the room. The, there were moderators who can control the conversation. But I would say that generally speaking, the conversations were very, very significant for the tone of respect, of mutual respect and engagement. Um, of course, as I had mentioned earlier, there were people who denied de genocide or denied detention camps, and that is not respectful. That is very hurtful. Um, but on the other hand, I would say that over hours of listening and binging on all of this over the last few days, um, most people were very, very, very respectful. Everyone had a turn. It was like, um, like open mic night where everyone had a turn to go on stage to say a few words for a few minutes and then the next person would speak. And sometimes, you know, um, the conversations would just sort of move from hour to hour. And some of these rooms lasted for days. Uh, some of the rooms lasted for over 100 hours. As the moderator would get tired, they would hand on the responsibilities to somebody else. And these rooms would just exist. Um, just so people have a sense, when you get on the Clubhouse app, it's it's you scroll through a, a lot of rooms that are available for you to walk into. And the algorithm sort of determines the rooms you see because there are so many rooms at this point uh, based on your follows, who you're connected to, um, the interests that you have indicated when you start the app. So um, 
So that that's how it works. And and uh, sometimes these rooms would have thousands of people. Sometimes these rooms would be very intimate and just have um, 20 or 30 people. But, um, you know, there were a lot of these rooms and you could pop between uh, a room talking about Xinjiang. You would go to a room talking about Hong Kong. You'd go to a room where people in Hong Kong were speaking in Cantonese only. Um, you could go to a Mandarin speaking room. It was very fascinating. And then we come to the um, to the crackdown by the by the Beijing government. Uh, so uh, let's repercure those moments. Uh, what's been the official reason uh, Clubhouse has been shut down? Yeah, and I, I I apologize. Earlier you had asked about how Clubhouse is available in China too. So um, Clubhouse has never been available on the Apple Store App Store in China. Um, so what people in China were starting to do was that they would get on their iPhone and switch the their store location from China to another country, and then they would then download Clubhouse. It's not clear, and no one has been able to get an answer from Clubhouse, whether this was a choice from the company or whether there was a ban for, of Clubhouse already that we did not know about off the Apple Store. So that's something that we don't know. But suffice to say that it was fairly easy for someone from China who really wanted to get on Clubhouse to download the app and then register and become a user. What happened this uh, Monday, and uh, just to give a date in case uh, people don't know, and Monday, February 8th, is that China did move their soft ban to a hard ban which meant that um, you can't download the app even if you switch stores um, and that it is just much more difficult, even if you have a circumnavigation tool like a virtual private network, a VPN. As things stand, even as I checked a few hours ago, there are still users from China on the app, but they were mostly those who managed to join and download the app before the ban, and it's questionable what will happen if they don't update the app, you know, because there are regular updates to apps. So uh, maybe in the long run, that group will also start diminishing. Do you think it's this, what happened is more interesting for the Chinese or for the people uh, who uh, tend to understand what the Chinese think? I think that's a great question. Um, I think what happened, and again, going back to the fact that if you ask somebody in China right now, hey, do you know about Clubhouse? They would most likely say, I've never heard of this app, even in a big city like Shanghai or something. So, so the question is, does Clubhouse matter, right? <laughs> if most people in China haven't heard about it and so few people used it. And I think that, um, the app was probably more, it's hard to say, for those who were outside China, curious about what people think inside China, I think it's been very, very important for them to hear, hear these voices. It's the, it, you know, it, it's the, it, it's so few voices, it's a few thousand voices, but it's better than zero, right? And I think that's what's significant about it, is just to get a little crack. And that's exactly what a Chinese in China said. This is just a crack in the wall, just a little bit, but it was helpful and it was needed, I think. For a long time, um, there hasn't been this kind of engagement. And I think that um, China decided to finally move on the ban. Everyone knew that it was going to happen. It's just a question of when. And I think that once these rooms really started picking up momentum, most likely, if you have room of thousands of Mandarin speakers, one of them will be, for example, a Communist Party member. In fact, I was in a room where somebody identified themselves as a Communist Party member, and they had, you know, questions, um, just like all the other participants, but there are very likely, there were very likely Communist Party members who were not just on Clubhouse just to use it casually, but also to take notes. And at some point, you know, word got up to higher levels 
that this thing was happening and somebody decided to pull the plug. And another question is, as far as I understood, uh, uh, technically speaking, Clubhouse is kind of, uh, let, let me say, hierarchical, right? Uh, because in every room there is a couple of moderators who can speak and there are some people who can all only listen to. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it works like... Uh, you have to be invited. So how, how did it work that there were such huge discussions, you know, like uh, horizontal discussions? Yes. Discuss, uh, everybody could speak. So it doesn't quite work like that in terms of hierarchy. Um, anyone can start a room and anyone can designate themselves a moderator. And um, anyone in the crowd can speak. They put their hands up and the moderator will bring them up. And what was happening was very democratic. In one room, um, the moderator would just simply look at everyone who put up their hands and just go down the order and bring people up, maybe, you know, 10 people up at a time on stage. And then each person will get two minutes. There was even a timer that would ring after two minutes that you could hear um, from the moderator's audio. And then that person would have to, that person on st stage would have to stop speaking and they have to go on mute. And the, and, and the moderator even went, boy, girl, boy, girl, just uh, for gender parity. So it was also really remarkable until in terms of the self-organization and um, the self-organization to be fair and democratic. Um, and there were people, there would be people who would go on and speak for two minutes and say something most people in the room perhaps would disagree with. And um, and generally speaking, people did not interrupt. They would let that person finish speaking and then they would get off stage and then the next person would come up and sometimes they would say something to rebut the previous speaker. And this went on and on for hours and hours. Generally, when uh, the Chinese government bans some uh, Western apps, let's say uh, Twitter, Facebook and so on, they generally, there is some uh, uh, local company that produces uh, some parallel uh, uh, app uh, that becomes mainstream and sometimes it becomes more, 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 more widespread and powerful than the Western ones. Let's consider Weibo. Let's think of uh, WeChat uh, with, uh, in comparison with WhatsApp and so on. You see with Clubhouse, they have already something in their pocket in China. <laughs> There are already stories about um, Chinese startups and companies and investors working on a clubhouse replica, but there are questions even within those in China and tech wondering how realistic some app equivalent in China would be in terms of success. The number one problem is the real-time audio, right? This is a state that wants to censor what people say. So um, if, if it's real-time audio, then it can evade the censors in a way I don't think the Chinese government is comfortable with. So that's number one. Although it's tantalizing to think about in terms of um, perhaps this can happen. There can be an alternative Clubhouse China uh, copy um, if you know they have the machine learning and AI tools. This is going to be a demonstration of just how good Chinese AI and machine learning is because if they can monitor real-time audio, um, then, then, then that's a, that's a huge step forward for, uh, authoritarian technology. So I think this remains to be seen. Um, but I think, um, for sure that it's definitely happening. It's just a question of whether the state will come in and stop it or whether they think they have the toolkit, the technological toolkit to manage it. The story uh, about people in China paying to get access to clubhouse, to be invited. Is it true first? And then uh, your opinion, is it because they wanted to participate to some a sensitive Mingan topic or because of business reasons? I think, I think it's a fear of missing out. I think a lot of people heard that this was a hot app and people wanted to get on it to see what uh, was happening on Clubhouse. And I think that once you get on Clubhouse, then the user individually might be drawn to business you know, uh, topics and rooms 
versus um, more sensitive topics. But um, there were definitely uh, sales of of invites, and 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 it's fascinating and very ingenious actually, and of 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 Chinese. Um, business people, I guess, <laughs> opportunists, because the way the invites work is actually, it's possible to have infinite invites. If you think about it, each user gets two invites. So you can sell one invite and then invite yourself to create a new account and keep doing that and keep replicating that. So um, people were, were doing that. And I saw evidence of that. At first, I thought these were trolls. Um, and I, I actually tweeted as much because I, I found an account and I kept so so the uniqueness with Clubhouse is it shows who invited you. So you can always see these social connections. That's another privacy issue for people in China, by the way. Um, but if you can see who invited you, you can go back and there was a Chinese speaker who I realized when I saw who invited him or her um, had a very weird account name. And then I kept going back to looking at who invited who invited the previous person, who invited the previous person, and you keep going back. There were all these basically funny, funny accounts that were clearly just uh, random digits and names and, and stuff like that. And I realized um, something funny was going on. And, and then someone explained to me these sales. So that's what's, what was happening is somebody would sell an invite and then they create an account. And because they don't want to spend time thinking up of a name, they just type random letters on, on the laptop and get approved for a new invite. So it, it's really fascinating that there were, were people willing to spend. I mean, I guess if you're in China and you want to hear sensitive topics uh, and you have a little bit of money, $70 is not that much money for you to have a have access for a week or two, knowing that it would eventually be banned. Yes, let me get back to the ban because uh, yeah, you explained how it went uh, is, a, is a timeline, but uh, what I wanted to know is what's the official reason it's being shut down? We don't know. <laughs> like, a, We don't know. like a lot of authoritarian states, they don't tell you. <laughs> they just do it. And then everyone is, is left not sure. And so I was actually on Clubhouse in a room when news broke that there were people who was who were in China struggling to get on the app and that it looked as if there was a ban and people were confirming with each other. And there was absolute panic in the rooms. It was rather dramatic. It was like watching breaking news happen on a, in a digital space. And it, it was even to a point where one moderator said, maybe everyone in line speaking who want to speak, maybe everyone in China should jump the line and be first so that they can get priority to quickly speak because maybe they won't be able to speak soon. So it was um, it was quite dramatic. And then there were some Chinese who suddenly became very worried about being on the app and whether they should delete the app and whether they would get in trouble. And um, other people trying to calm users down and say, well, there are thousands and thousands of people who've spoken the last few days. Surely the Chinese state will not go after you. You are mostly listening. You will be fine. They'll probably go after the most prominent people. And most of the prominent people, um, you know, have already been in trouble with the Chinese state before. So they knew what they were doing. So you were having these kind of calculated decisions. And of course, everyone at at that time talking also knew that there had to be people um, in the room um, who were essentially snitches. Yeah, I was asking this because uh, on the same day the Clubhouse application has been uh, shut down in China, the Italian data, data protection regulator, the Italian responsible for GDPR, sent a letter to Clubhouse saying that if they don't reply in two weeks to many privacy concerns, Uh, the application should be shut down also in our country, also uh, in theory in the whole Europe, because it doesn't comply to a lot of, um, of regulations, especially we don't know what's done with the um, audio, because, okay, officially it's not recorded, but we also know that the real goal for, this, uh, for these companies is to uh, use audio tracks for machine learning. So it's not about the content, but it's about identity and identifying the, the terms. Can I add something to that? Because it's fantastic. I'm so glad you brought that up because um, several things that were also being discussed in these Mandarin speaking rooms was concern about privacy and what Clubhouse metadata was being picked up 
what was encrypted and what was not. So people were aware that this was a problem. And just so you know, um, Clubhouse asks to get access to your address book on your phone when you when you um, start the app. I said no. Um, and that prevents me from using some features on Clubhouse. But most people just go ahead and say yes, because that's the way people act. Exactly. And the other thing is the Clubhouse co-founder has said that the audio is not safe, but that there is a temporary buffer, which to me sounds like a recording that maybe you record and then you delete in 24 hours, but there's still a recording and that's a huge problem. And, and the reason why they decided to do that is because if something happens in a room um, that is criminal or, or people feel like violates the terms, especially racist r remarks um, or bullying, that they, they and people in the room can complain to Clubhouse, Clubhouse, uh, they say, need to be able to review what happened in the room in order to make a determination about deleting accounts or kicking people off the app. So it, it's very complicated, right? Like how do you deal with the situation when something is in real time and really awful things are being spoken about? Like for example, anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial, and you need to kick somebody off the app for that. You need to also be able to review uh, the, the, the room and what was actually said. So they have this temporary buffer and the other thing, Marco, which I'm sure you know, um, is that some of the back end technology for the audio is apparently provided by a Chinese company called Agora with offices in the United States and in China. But according to the Securities and Exchange Commission filing to the United States government by Agora, there appears to be the possibility that some things can fall under the jurisdiction of Chinese law. And Chinese law is very expansive in terms of what the government can ask private companies in terms of data. So there is a there is a lot of good reasons for the Italian government to be asking these questions of Clubhouse. And it's interesting to hear that they have done so. Yeah, also because from Europe, since 2020, when the Shield Act was uh, was uh, banned, uh, you can't even export European data to United States. So figure out from Europe to United States and then to China. It's even more interesting and engaging. Given that we are moving towards the end, let me move to another date. On Wednesday, the new US President Joe Biden spoke with Xi Jinping for the first time officially. In the call, he pointed out the exact same topics that Clubhouse users discussed when they could. Uh, I mean, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Taiwan. Some could then say that Clubhouse was just another foreign policy tool by the US government. What's your opinion instead? That's a little far-fetched. I mean, Clubhouse is a mm. private company run by two Silicon Valley, Valley tech bros. Again, I don't know if there's an Italian term for translating tech bros, but uh, they don't, they're not thinking about Biden. They're not thinking about Trump. They're not thinking about U.S. foreign policy. They're just thinking about making money. Um, so I don't see a connection between that. Uh, the fact is that uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and Xinjiang are big issues in China for any government. Um, to to be to be dealing with when they engage with China. Um, and those three topics are big topics for people in the Chinese speaking world. So those are the parallels, but I don't necessarily see see a relationship. Just commenting a little bit about Biden since we're on it. It is interesting though, that he um, really mentioned the human rights abuses. I, I also find it interesting that um, you know he he said he said that he's willing to work, the United States is willing to work with China when it benefits the American people. That's, that is, uh, to me, quite interesting because um, essentially that is Trump's America first policy, but spoken by a more polite president. Um, so anyone who thinks that China policy will change as a result of Trump uh, and then now Biden should understand that um, in the United States, China is a bipartisan issue that most people are on the same page with. We will keep following on uh, all these topics in the next episodes. But uh, for now, Melissa Chan, it's been a real pleasure to speak with you. And you brought us a lot of interesting starting points for other conversations. Have a great day. Have a great time. Thank you so much. And you guys asked very good questions. And it demonstrates your understanding of tech, which I think a lot of journalists don't have.